Hello everybody, I'm David Hetherington, and we're going to talk about the Level 3 exam and what to expect, how to succeed. I encourage you to watch this. If I could impress upon you just one simple thing, don't assume Level 3 will be the same as Level 1 and 2. And not just content, but what is it the Institute is looking for? You know, how come there are three exams? Why do they need three? Why not two? Why not one? What's the purpose? The Institute wants to test different types of skills at each level. So being complacent and thinking you know what to expect, that's actually what gets people in trouble. So let's see if we can kind of get you headed in the right direction. We'll talk about the pass rates. We'll talk about what things say about the exam. And this issue, what is different about level three? How do you adjust your study approach? It's not going to be completely different, but if you just sort of cruise along, man, you may be in some trouble. What can we do to help you with this situation? Uh, congratulations. It is not easy to reach level three. We would estimate the vast majority of candidates who sign up for level one never make it to level three. You're already a success. You're well above average. But that's also sort of the downside. You're competing with other people that are above average. So the Institute has got some new ideas. Level one, it really was about factoids. I don't know if you've heard, uh, you know, level one, memorize and recite factoids. Work 5,000 multiple choice questions and you'll pass because it is very factual in nature. Uh, most charter holders say they consider level two the hardest exam because the processes that are being tested are longer and you've got to work through the material very precisely, but they are deterministic. They're all based essentially on mathematical type rules and principles. Then you hit level three. Now you need all the skills you already have from one and two, but the shift is now more towards judgment. And it corresponds with making half the exam written. You're not just picking A, B, or C. And that really does require a little bit of a mental shift in your approach. It's not that it's that difficult. Level two is le generally labeled the most difficult exam, not level three. Many charter holders say they think level three is the easy exam, but it's not automatic you're going to pass. And that's a, that's a difficult thing to convey. I don't want to imply you can't pass level three. You can. It could be a lot of fun. But if you go at it as if it's no different, that can really get you into trouble. So please don't make that mistake. So what do you need to know? Well. Ethics, behavioral finance, you start with that. They pervade the portfolio management process. PM, portfolio management. That is what the level three exam focuses on, which was not an important topic at level one and two. You will spend an extensive amount of time on what's called the client investment policy statement, both at the individual and institutional level, things you need to know. You'll look at forming capital market expectations, which really means applied economics. You blend the client and market expectations to create what's called the strategic asset allocation. Along the way, we'll talk about risk management using derivatives to modify portfolio risk and return characteristics. We'll delve into some particulars related to currency, fixed income, equity, alternative investments, a lot of things you need to know. As you go into the home stretch, making trades in the portfolio, monitoring and evaluating, and reporting the results of the investment organization, which is GIPS, the Global Investment Performance Standard. One of the key differences in level three is it's all about portfolio management. You could consider this diagram the entire portfolio management process as it exists at level three. So everything is very highly interrelated with each other. You will regularly find a reading talking about something. In a later study session, they'll come back at it again. In another study session, they'll come back at it again. They're not inconsistent, but they may be looking at the same issues from slightly different perspectives different tone, different emphasis on what they want to focus on. So you've got to start beginning to think about how do things fit within the process and not focusing exclusively on individual items. You're thinking more holistically. So let's take a look at the historical pass rates. 
I got some great news. Take the exam in 1964. You had a 94% pass rate. Now, the bad news is I don't think anybody has a time machine. We can't go back to 1964. What's the recent history? Well, it's been pretty stable. The pass rate is running a little bit above 50%. A little random variation, not a lot, a little bit better than 50-50. When you think about how hard it is to get to level three, you shouldn't be overly complacent about a 50-50 pass rate. How do you get on the correct side of the number? You want to be in the success category. Number one. The fact that you got here does not guarantee you're going to pass. So what is it you're going to do to improve your odds? How do we get on the right side of this information? Another thing I want you to notice is the number of people taking the exam. Now, it's small compared to level one and two because you're a pretty elite group. The average person that takes one and two never makes it to level three. You're in an elite group. Yet the pass rate is only a little bit better than 50%. But then look at the number of papers that have to be graded. Remember at level three, half the exam is written. Somebody has to physically read all the answers and decide how to score them. Of course, no one person can do that. There's a large team of graders. Once you know what they're doing, you are prepared for what's expected, and your chances of going up improve. When you just go in there and say, oh, I'm a smart person, I'm going to do what I think makes sense, mm, that can be a problem. I bet some of you have heard the old story, right answer, wrong answer, CFA answer. They only take the CFA answer. It's easy to do when it's ABC. But when there's blank paper and you've got to decide what to write, you really need to know what's expected of you, or you can easily be part of the group that does not succeed at level three. I like this idea of the Peter Principle. Level one, in hindsight, was pretty simple, straightforward stuff. Level two, in hindsight, you needed to have more going on. There were longer thought processes. Level three, the stakes go up because there's other things going on. And that's what I like to talk about is the light bulb. If it will occur to you what is going on at level three, you can make the adjustment. And it's not that it's overly hard. But all those candidates who just keep thinking, I'm going to keep going the way I did for one and two, they often run into trouble. That's our simple message to you. What do people say? Charter holders say they often think it's the easiest. Yet candidates express incredible confusion. I don't even know what they want me to do at level three. The institute is confusing me. I think the problem is some candidates go in with an, 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 an implicit belief that they already know what's going to be expected. And the Institute's looking for something different. What is expected of them? Candidates say they don't know. What can be reasonably tested? You have to apply some judgment. What is it of what they've shown me could actually be asked in an exam-like setting? And those are the kinds of things we want to get across to you. That's part of understanding how to approach level three. And those are not the kind of statements we make at level one and two. There's something just a little bit different about level three. The Institute talks about constructed response, varying structures, point values change, multiple parts related to a case study, investment challenges, and can the candidate solve it? They also talk about the idea of specificity. You've got to be on point to this question. You may be thinking about other questions on the same topic. You can't recite things that don't really apply here. Yet, when you look at the exam and they release the level three more in the exam, there aren't that many surprises on it. Almost everything is pretty predictable that they ask you about. So why isn't the pass rate higher? Again, it's this misunderstanding. It's a, mis it's a belief you know something that isn't actually true. If we can just get you going in the right direction, you could actually have a lot of fun this year and you could make it the last year of a CFA exam. There is less material. The reading is shorter. A lot of it is not very technical. 
which can be very frustrating to a level two who thinks everything's supposed to be technical. Yet a great deal of the level three material is non-technical. And multiple readings talk about the same issue, which some people try to microanalyze and say, well, it's contradictory. They didn't say the same thing. It's wordy. There's a lot more stuff going on. But if you think of it like a portfolio manager, if you try to identify what were the main points being made, you find the level three curriculum is highly consistent. If you're overly fixated on detail, you're saying something's wrong. But when you step back and say, what were the main pace being made? Oh, actually, this is much simpler than the things you did at level one and two. Change your perspective, and level three can be a very enjoyable process. You are used to multiple choice questions, A, B, C. And this is a well-studied phenomenon. We didn't invent this. You can find research that talks about multiple choice versus constructed response. And what they point out is you could take a, group, a, a candidate group, you could give them questions A, B, C, and they would do really, really well. They can clearly identify, here are three choices. Which one of these is the best answer? They don't have a problem doing that. But if you took a statistically identical group of candidates, asked them the exact same questions, but you didn't give them answer choices A, B, C, you just gave them blank paper and say, you write an acceptable answer, suddenly the scores are dramatically lower. It's not the skill of the candidates that's different. It's not the questions. It's not the technical material that's different. It's simply the exam format that's different. And the reason is constructed response requires more judgment, more choice. What do I think are the most relevant things to talk about? I'm not being clued in A, B, or C, which is best. I've got to decide what to write, or rather you will, because of course I've already got the chart and I don't have to take it again. But that's what we want to get across to you at level three. How do you make these decisions on a timed exam and do it well and successfully? The scores are dramatically lower for constructed response, and it's not the material that's different. It's the exam format that creates this, and this is not particular to the CFA exam. This is a well-understood phenomenon across all examination processes. Constructed response is different. The morning will be constructed response. It's essay. It's creative writing. You hear those terms. There are typically 9 to 12 questions in the morning. They each have multiple parts. And commonly in the morning, people cannot finish the exam. The last one, two, three questions, they never even get to them. One, two, or three questions when there's only 9 to 12, that's a huge percentage of your points. So when you simply run out of time, it is a serious impediment to success. You don't need to if you know what is expected and how to do it. First off, it is an essay. Essay is a term most people are familiar with from college and other academic settings. That is not what constructed response is. It's not college essay. It's also not creative writing. The Institute is not interested in your opinions. They are interested in did you follow a taught process and it would lead to an expected result. If it does, you're fine. Otherwise, take the exam next year. I don't mean to be harsh, but you've got to give up the idea that this is your time to tell what you think. It's not. It's your time to demonstrate an understanding of the content. It is constructed response is the more technical term for it. The afternoon will be more familiar. The afternoon is the 10 six-question vignette, multiple choice, that you're familiar with from level two. And the institute says the scores in the morning are dramatically, materially lower than the afternoon. So the, the constructed response format is giving people serious problems. Candidates generally do well in the afternoon, afternoon, but do poorly in the morning. So part of success is dealing with that. Let's improve where it's easy to add value, which is the morning. Just taking a recent exam to make it specific, 
every single question in the morning tied to the portfolio management question. Specifically, there were 10 questions. They re ranged from 13 to 22 minutes. Minutes are the number of points you can receive. But each of those questions had subparts ranging from three to nine minutes. So there's wide variation. You may have heard people talk about template and lined paper. They changed the exam format a couple years ago. We do provide you with the old exams. The questions, many of them are still relevant, but they've subtly changed the uh, layout. Instead, every single part, you're directed to a specific page in the exam book where you must write your answer. There's ample room. You're not going to run out of space. Stop worrying about that. There's plenty of room. You're going to see that when you look at the exams. The issue is deciding what is pertinent. Now, subjectively, when we looked at that exam, less than 2% of the questions could be called surprising. By 2%, I mean point value. They're not surprising topics. They're not particularly arguable what the answer is. You just have to know how to do it and how to write what they're expecting to find, and then you will be successful. And those are what we will stress during the course of your preparation. As I pointed out, it's a process. It is highly interconnected, these topics. So what doesn't work is to focus on a reading and say, I must understand everything in this reading before I will move forward. No, you should go through it. You should move on, keep going, because often you don't know what the importance of an item is until you get later into the portfolio management process. Stop thinking about study sessions or even topics as standalone. In the real world, they're not. And in many ways, I like to point out the level three exam is more real world-like than one and two. Typical question, constructed response, here's an example. 1A would have been the very first question you saw. Formulate the return objectives for the first year of Hank's retirement. Calculate the after-tax nominal rate of return required to achieve the CARS objectives for the first year of Hank's retirement. Show your calculations, 12 minutes. Do not make up tax benefits associated with the charitable gift. That's the way questions are worded. They're very, very specific in what they're looking for. Formulate. You'll know what that means. We'll talk about that. Calculate after tax, first year. There's a definitive process you should have gone through. Show your calculations. They're not interested in you writing down 4.5%. I'm making up a number. Maybe that's the number. You would not get 12 points of credit for that. You haven't shown them you know how to formulate a return objective or make the calculations. They want to see the workflow. That's why it's not ABC. It's not about the final number. In fact, most candidates never get full credit on any single question. You shouldn't even be worried about that. You should be worried about going through the appropriate process to maximize your demonstration of that you know this topic. So we will have well prepared you for this. It's an incredibly predictable type of question. But the facts will vary every year, so the exact calculations change each time. There would, of course, been a lot of information you would have read that you would have worked from. Now, let's jump ahead, though, because we're not yet teaching you how to do it. We'll spend a cl an entire class dealing with the basic issues of the IPS and related. But let's jump ahead. Because you can't just be thinking about how to do it. you got to think about what's going to happen with my answer after I do it. They can't put it into a computer to check A, B, or C. Someone has to read what you write, and they have to evaluate you. So the graders have a guideline answer and a grading key. The guideline answer isn't important, the, and that's released. The grading key is what's important, and you never get to see it. The grading key describes what a well-constructed answer will say, and the point value that goes with each of the items that would be part of a full credit answer. And then the graders are simply evaluating whether you knew what to do. So if you're just creating your own answers, it will not go well.
But if you're applying the process that's in the curriculum, you're going to do just fine. It's not going to be that tricky in the end. There is then an audit process. If a grader is not following that process, their grade will be thrown out. Your paper will be rescored following the grading key. So I want to stress on you, it's not enough to just say, I think my answer works. Your reasoning actually doesn't matter in the sense that all that will count is whether you understood the CFA's reasoning, their, the Institute's reasoning, and followed the process they expect. It's becoming aware of that. It, it's like any professional setting. There are certain baseline expectations. If you don't meet them, you're just not going to succeed in, unless you create a new industry. But you're not going to be able to change the Institute. It's up to you to kind of get with the program, demonstrate you understand it, and it is a widely understood program. It certainly will be good for you as you try to advance your career. So begin to think about, I have to know the underlying body of knowledge, what we here call the taught material. I have to make sure I'm focused specifically on the question being asked this time and not a question last year. Stop worrying about last questions. Don't multitask. Focus on the specific question being asked and the case facts presented in this question. The questions are written and the data is presented very carefully. So if you look at all three of those things, there will be a nice little intersection. Be within that intersection, your answer will be acceptable. But when you lose track of that and you forget one aspect, you focus on the question, you focus on the case facts, but you forget about the way you were taught to analyze it, you're in trouble. You think about what you were taught, you think about the case facts, but you don't get around to answering the exact question asked. You're in trouble. So begin to think about, I've got to step back and look at all three aspects. Trust the Institute wrote the question. It won't be that difficult if you follow this model. Forget it, and then you get in trouble. So the graders have predetermined points. Did you organize and state what the cars want to achieve? That's going to depend heavily on the case facts as well as on what you were taught to look for. As you get into the calculation, you're correctly labeling what you're doing so someone can follow your process. And the process you'll learn is we need to calculate the starting value of the portfolio for the first year. What is it? We need to calculate and quantify what we will need the first year, and then we can start to proceed with some percentage calculations. If they ask for after-tax, we want to make sure all the data is handled on an after-tax basis, and you'll also learn you have to deal with inflation correctly. Those are all part of the taught process. So what did the question ask for? What facts do you have to work with? And how do I organize it going through a logical process? And you must show your work. Simply getting the right numeric result isn't good enough anymore. Explain how you went through it. And those are the kind of things we will emphasize as we go through the classes. Partial credit. There's nothing wrong with that. It's pretty normal. But let's do better than average. The Institute has said 50% credit is pretty normal on a given question. So if you start doing better than 50% on each question, you're above average for level three. You're doing fine. So begin to find ways to improve. Stop trying to aim for 100%. Perversely, that's a mistake. Start. Do your best, look at where you missed something, begin to refine the process, learn from your mistakes, and you will begin to be successful. Hey, by the way, if you were an equity analyst and you were right 100% of the time, what do you think we can conclude? Uh, probably that they're delusional, they don't remember reality. This is a risky business. You don't get to be right 100%. So stop thinking of the exam. They're not doing level one. It's not just factoids to recite. They're, they understand there's now judgment. There's thinking about, is it more this or more that? The Institute doesn't expect perfection. They want to see if you can do better than the average level three candidate, and they reward you with your charger if you do that. So uh, give up the idea of 100%. 
try to start treating this exam like a professional. This is tough. We're not supposed to get everything right. I want to show I am doing better than the average level three candidate. That's what's expected to become a charter holder. Minutes. Each question in each part is assigned a number of minutes. That will be the number of points. In the morning, you will have 180 minutes, three hours, which means there's 180 potential points that can be earned. The afternoon will be 10 six-question vignettes. That is 60 questions. Each one is worth three points. In the end, the total number of points you got right will be added up, divided by 360, and that is your percentage score. So it is purely an exam where they see how many points did you get right. Now, answering and grading ABC is easy. Answering and grading constructed response is harder. And again, give up the idea of perfection. Expect you will have to skip some questions. Come back later if you have time. But if you simply go through and try to answer every question, you very likely will run out of time. It is a major contributor to failing the exam. The Institute has made the exact same statements. They have said flat out, if candidates would stop trying to answer the questions they don't understand, if they would skip those questions, their scores would go up and the number of candidates who pass would increase. So please hear what we're saying. Please hear what the Institute is saying. And stop going for this, I just want to get everything right. It is a mistake. It's not that kind of exam. Judiciously skipping questions is part of how a professional gets through their day. You read the material. You watch the videos. You listen. You think. And you practice. Repetitive practice, improving on your weak points, is how you're going to be successful at level three. Now, that's not dramatically different from level one and two, but this judgment, this writing, that's going to take some kinds of practice that were not important at level one and two, or were certainly much less important. They become more critical at level three. So have a study plan and plan to get through all the basic material at least a month before the exam. To do that on a weekly basis, I need to go through the notes, I need to watch the videos, I need to do the readings, some combination of those. I strongly recommend coming to class. That's where you get the more subtle judgment. We will be practicing the writing skills in each class. You can't really do that all on your own just by reading or watching. Class is a much more effective approach at level three. We will provide you questions on the material every week. You should be working them. You should do some practice. How much? I don't know. Do the reading, come to class, spend a couple hours in practice. You have done your part because that's only the preliminary study and that needs to be finished at least a, a month before the exam. Then, then after you've done it, that's not final study. That's just to get ready for the final push for the last month. That's when you move to more practice-like exams, practice exams, etc. But again, I want to stress this working practice is important. It's been well demonstrated that candidates who do practice questions do better than those who don't, even when they don't get the right answers initially. It's simply the act of forcing yourself to make a best effort. You're a smart person. You'll begin to learn from your successes and failures. But you want to work some questions immediately after each section. Do not hold QBank until the last study. At level three, QBank is not final preparation. QBank is to be used each week. I stress that. QBank is to be used weekly. It is not to wait for final study. It doesn't work well with constructed response if you do that. In the final month, that's when you move into the prax exams, the recent AM exams which the Institute releases. Those are your best sources of final practice because then you've got to start to pull it together.
Yes, the review course is a good idea. Yes, mock exams are good. But those become your focus in the last four to six weeks. And an awful lot of candidates never got there at one and two. It's important you have ample time to work on prax exams at level three. I cannot overstress that. And one time's not enough. Particularly with constructed response, you not only need to be able to take those questions, review them, work on your weaknesses, put it aside, do some other things, and then go back and retake a prax exam. And why aren't you getting 90% right the second time through? I noticed that many candidates just want to work a lot of questions. But after a point, they don't actually get better. They just keep working more stuff and getting the same score. That's not good enough. So have the time to take it, review your mistakes, and be able to go retake it and validate you are, in fact, improving. That's how you move from the almost good enough to I'm done with this process and I've been successful. The topic weightings at level three are much more vague than at level one and two. The institute does not follow specific weights. And they say even this is only a general guideline and they don't have to adhere to it in any single year. They allow themselves much more variation. They also say they consider essentially all of this portfolio management. So while they do divide it up into these topic areas, they also stress it's all from a portfolio management perspective. So it's equally true to say the level three exam is 100% portfolio management. Again, these are different than the way they looked at things at level one and two. The institute is changing. It's your responsibility to change with them, don't fight them, and we can help you with that. Vague and ultimately, it's all portfolio management. I spent the last month working and reworking. I rewrote answers. I learned from my mistakes. That's the key to success here. I need that incremental improvement. I don't know what your weak points will be. I don't know where you're going to have trouble. you got to go find that out. And then those are the things you work on. So don't worry about asking, where's the op area I need more help on? I don't know. You'll find that out from your scores, and then you will tailor your focus to what works. The unsuccessful essentially made the mistake of not getting around to that. You need more time for prax exams. And of course, there are always going to be a few surprise questions. Do your best and don't get hung up on them. Let them go. Shrug them off. I think that's why the Institute puts them in there. Stop obsessing about that. It's only five points. Oh, it was a trick question. Let's move on and get the other questions right. That's how you succeed. Kurt Schultz and I, others at Kaplan, we can assist you. We have lots of experience with this. We will show you how to do it. And sometimes we have to, may have to tell you, hey, stop doing that. That's just not going to work. Let's not argue about why it doesn't work. It clearly got the wrong answer. Let's move over here to what works. That's part of success. Let go of the stuff that's failing. Focus on what's succeeding. Build a success portfolio, and you will do much better off. Now, we have ample opportunities in terms of the classroom. We have online classes, various lectures available to you. Yes, various material you can use, lots of resources. Do talk with customer service. I am a strong believer, particularly at level three, include the classroom, either live or online, because you really need people leading you through not just the content, but how a portfolio manager would have thought about that material and applied it in a particular setting. That's the nature of the exam questions. Uh, again, various ways you can approach this, review courses. These are good ideas. Take a look at them, but I would build your basic program off. Reading the underlying material, attending class each week, a full month plus of intense practice exams in various formats. You can find this is not a difficult exam if you take that approach. Final reviews, great idea if you need them as well. That question, we showed it to you 1A. 
read the case facts. We've included that uh, in our constructed response videos. We do continue with it and take you through how to solve it, but it's going to be different. It's not just learn a single formula. It's take what was asked, what are the taught body of knowledge, what were the case facts. In those videos, we will take you through how to apply and answer those questions. This was just the get you started version. So here's the information. I'm not going to go through it with you at this point. Again, we do that in the constructed response videos, but read through it on your own. And maybe even try to make an answer and just realize how many things you're guessing at. Yet the successful candidate is going to say, I know exactly what I should have done. And I see where each of these pieces of information sp fits specifically in what I was taught to do. And the answer is actually not mysterious at all. But you've got to know how to approach it. And you can see the amount of information is relatively large. Relatively large. Now, I'll give you a hint. So when you go to the exam, you will turn to the first page, and here will be a question. It will say, question one is a total of X parts for a total of how so many minutes. And you will see a bunch of information. You don't want to start reading that. The first thing you would do is you would go and find the actual question. I already showed it to you early. Formulate the return objective for the first year of retirement. Read those facts. What specifically do they want to accomplish? and then go through a calculation process where you quantify the base, you quantify the need, you deal with it as a ratio return, and you handle the inflation component, all part of a taught process. If you know the material, if you know the facts, if you know the question, it's not going to be that difficult to write an acceptable answer on the exam. You can make your own good luck. You do it with the right kind of preparation. We want this to be the last year you take a C exam. There's not a CFA 4. We don't want you coming back next year for the CFA exam process. You're on to other things. But you'll need to know what is expected and how to deliver on exam day to make that happen. I hope we see you in the classes. Good luck.